Welcome to the first day of the St. Louis Regional Freightways Freight Week STL 2023. I'm Mary Lamey, Executive Vice President of Multimodal Enterprises for Bi-State Development, which includes the St. Louis Regional Freightway as one of its enterprises. We're kicking off Freight Week STL with Innovation Day, during which we're featuring some of the emerging technologies that have tremendous potential to impact the movement of freight in the years to come. In our first session of the day, you'll learn about the continuing work by St. Louis startup Intermotive Autonomous Rail on the development of an autonomous zero emissions rail car that would be able to operate without the use of a locomotive. We'll share the latest details on their progress towards commercial launch of a new solution that has the potential to make the U.S. rail system more efficient and sustainable, while also expediting the supply chain process. Before we dive in, we'd like to start with thanking our sponsors. This year's presenting sponsors include the Boeing Center at Washington University, Steadfast City St. Louis, University of Missouri St. Louis, Millstone Weber, and Amron. Our supporting sponsors are the Jerry Costello Group and the Hauser Group. Associate sponsors for this year include Southern Illinois Builders Association, Terracon, Alberici, Castle Contracting, HNTB, CDI, and Brinkman Constructors. We appreciate all the sponsorship support that makes it possible for us to deliver Freight Week STL. Our panelist today is Tim Lucini, co-founder and CEO of Intermotive Autonomous Rail. Welcome back, Tim. This is your second time joining us for Freight Week STL, but some of our audience may be new. So let's start with a quick introduction of your background and your organization. Hey, thanks, Mary. It's good to be back again. Always happy to share what we're building in St. Louis and uh, what we're trying to bring into the rail industry. But uh, for those of you that uh, may not know me, my name is Tim Lucchini. I'm the CEO of Intramotive, and uh, we are based here in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, and the background there is really my co-founders and I started this business in January of 2020, uh, while my co-founder, Alex Pfeiffer, was doing his MBA at USC and Really, at that time, it was just the beginning of the pandemic, uh, starting to look at all the sensitivities in the freight industry. Uh, but we've continued to grow this business, and uh, we've got a nice line of sales built up. More than 20 engineers here working on it in the St. Louis area and uh, getting our first delivery contracts underway here. Um, my background, just prior to Intramotive, I was an engineering manager in the aerospace industry. I was managing teams up to, to 40 engineers at a time building products like flying cars and, and package delivery drones, as well as different types of defense platforms. Uh, and then my background is really a technologist. So I did my PhD at Michigan State in engineering, uh, did my undergrad in uh, engineering in South Dakota. And then I also serve as an adjunct professor here in the St. Louis area, uh, teaching engineering classes at WashU and at UMSL. Um, and then as far as my team goes here, uh, Alex Pfeiffer, Corey Bassamalai, uh, have really been pushing us forward in St. Louis, uh, and Alex and I grew up again uh, together, so we've had a long uh, history of, of working together and uh, excited to continue to build this product and, and build this technology uh, as we bring it forward. Tim, give us a quick overview of the autonomous rail cars you're developing and issues in the industry that you hope to address with this new alternative. Yeah. So we're building a battery electric self-propelled rail car. Uh, fundamentally, it kind of fits in between where our locomotive would be at traditionally and where a rail car would be at on its own. Um, and we're pulling together a lot of different technologies from different areas. So the battery electrification movement uh, is very real and pressing. And then we've got the technology that go with that to add for things like controls, autonomy, uh, that bring a platform together uh, that we think we can start to change the way that people think about rail. Rail has been the backbone of the economy for a long time, and we feel confident that the railroads are here to stay. And if we can give them something that has the flexibility to work in the normal rail consist and train, as well as giving them a tool to be competitive with trucks, uh, offering that speed and flexibility and that fraction of a cost, fraction of environmental emissions, and a more timely uh, solution for their customers' demand, um, we can solve a couple of the pain points that the industry tends to suffer from. Um, and then when we look at uh, this intersection on the types of moves and, and the materials that we're looking at, we're still pretty focused on where rail has a, a large competitive advantage around commodity moves. So moving aggregate materials, 
moving agricultural products um, and uh, focus on that piece of the market uh, because rail has a large uh, existing cost advantage and we can now uh, offer something to be a little bit more advantageous from that speed and flexibility perspective. Um, I think there's a lot of discussion around growth for rail and how to actually achieve that. And I think one of the ways to do that is the solution that we're bringing to market. Um, the trends, I think, are global. So electrification is is coming and, and the environmental impact of what's taking place in electrification is, is really positive. Uh, and then in order to compete, you really have to do it at the same or better cost uh, than what you're dealing with today. And rail, again, is kind of uniquely situated in that space because of the energy efficiencies of rail uh, to potentially have a, a very large competitive advantage there. So we think the rail industry is kind of uniquely suited to be able to grow its market share uh, versus trucking uh, and any other mode of transportation in the logistics industry uh, and help continue to maintain and grow the, the $700 billion worth of goods that are, are moving across the country uh, via North American rail. Thank you, Tim. Tell us about the growth at Intermotive over the past year. Yeah, it's been an exciting year for us at Intermotive. Uh, we uh, moved to a new headquarters, so we now have uh, our original facility in Granite City, Illinois, uh, just across the river, as well as our North uh, St. Louis facility, which we opened up uh, 20,000 square feet of uh, space for us to grow into. Uh, we've got uh, an option for us to take over another 20,000 square feet on top of that. And it gives us the ability to produce the vehicles, uh, as well as continue to have the access to the testing facilities and test sites. So we can have about 500 feet of internal rail in one bay, uh, a second bay with another 500 uh, feet of inside rail, build the cars. And then we can also use our facility uh, here to uh, get the testing and integration work done. We closed another financing round since we last talked, and that's uh, been important for that growth, uh, putting those resources to good use uh, and continuing to uh, test and, and develop the products that we're building. And we also grew the team quite a bit. So really accelerating the development uh, of our primary product, uh, getting that into customer hands, as well as a couple of differentiated uh, products as well. But uh, over 20 employees joined us uh, in uh, 2022 and 2023 so far, uh, which is really exciting for us and, and uh, pretty important growth as we uh, continue to push this uh, company forward. That's fantastic. So what are some of the other significant accomplishments since you last presented at Freight Week in 2022? Yeah, so in 2022, we were uh, pursuing uh, customer LOIs and, and customer engagement using our commercial demonstration unit uh, at that time, which was a test bed that we had developed. They gave it that uh, self-repelled automation and, and ability to point-to-point -point dispatch and, and uh, the flexibility that we're talking about of the product called the Tugbolt. Now we've converted that into our MVP, which is that minimum viable product that we have uh, uh, contracts for six vehicles to, to be deployed to customers this year. Um, we're still pretty focused on captive private insular rail use cases, uh, things like mines, ports, uh, interplant material moves, um, and then still stepping into that broader rail industry uh, uh, as we prove it out as safe and reliable in these captive use cases. Uh, and really when we're looking at these mining cases in particular, or any of these captive use cases, we're showing these customers anywhere from a 30 to 80% OPEX reduction, uh, better utilization of the assets that they currently own. If they already have a fleet of rail cars, or if they already have, uh, uh assets that are on site. <clears throat> and we're also showing them that, uh, they can better utilize the infrastructure side of things. So, We've got rail everywhere all over the country. Uh, generally, it's still operating with as little as a 3% utilization factor. And we can show them how to get that utilization factor way up, keep materials moving, and, and better utilize those assets. Okay, so that's, that's fantastic. So let's back up just a little and have you give us an overview of how the tug bolt is being deployed in near-term uses and what the longer-term vision is. Yeah, so in these near-term use cases, we're, uh, again, looking at these things as, as mining, uh, as one example. And really, in those use cases, there's a lot of point-to-point -point moves that are considered insular by the Federal Road Administration. So these are things that can be anywhere from a mile to 60-plus miles 
uh, where the rail is not interchange connected uh, and that we can run these vehicles on um, and uh, deploy them. The vehicle itself still has all the required safety systems and appliances to be a rail car. So we have uh, traditional couplers, we have traditional air brakes, um, and we have the ability to pull short consist of rail cars. So if we want to pull a traditional rail car with us, we can do that as well. Uh, and that really gives us some flexibility as we start to look into these regulated use cases. So going from that private insular set of use cases to uh, networks that are interchange connected, uh, there's a regulatory change there, but uh, we're pretty excited that we're working through that uh, and have conversations with uh, federal regulators to go through a waiver process uh, and get these vehicles onto uh, routes that would be interchange connected. And that we're uh, seeing that as a stepping stone where we can step into those routes uh, being used as a, a rail car, uh, as well as this independent motive power that the Tugvolt product offers, uh, giving both the ability to complement a traditional long train going across the country, uh, enabling a short consist and then enabling independent point-to-point -point movement as well. Okay, so what are the next milestones you expect to reach? So as we step uh, forward there, uh, we're really moving beyond those captive use cases that we were worried about uh, last time we talked um, and going through um, the uh, the waiver process with the, the regulators. Uh, it's been really interesting on that side of things, just the uh, FRA in particular and, and some of the other uh, bodies that we need to work through are, are pretty open to new technology uh, and they're pretty open to what we're bringing to market, which is exciting uh, to see that openness uh, and be able to talk through the benefits of this technology uh, and then also what we would need to do to deploy it safely, reliably, and, and take advantage of many of the uh, environmental and, and other impacts that it can positively um, uh, bring forward. As far as other milestones, we're still going to be uh, continuing to grow the team. So we're going to be scaling the business uh, as we hit these first uh, set of vehicle deployments to be able to continue to grow into future deployments. Um, and uh, we've got the space and facilities here to be able to handle that. And then uh, in addition, we will continue to build out these local relationships uh, up and down the, the Mississippi rivers and other transload facilities uh, to continue to convert what we have as a large LOI pipeline uh, into more customer deployments. Um, but uh, that next step uh, is going to be working through regulated environments from these first use cases that we're deploying it um, and, and making sure that we're doing that in a safe and reliable way. Okay, so over the last couple of months, we've all heard about some of the train derailments that have shocked the industry. Tell us about how your vehicles might play a role in improving safety on the nation's rail system. Yeah, I think uh, the rail industry has definitely been front and center in a lot of news articles lately. Um, I think understanding uh, what the root cause of some of these uh, events has been uh, and then understanding the focus, uh, the intense focus on safety and making sure that the nation's rail systems are operating uh, at peak efficiency in a very safe way. Um, one of the sets of solutions is understanding what is taking place. We're on a traditional rail car. It's static. You don't have any uh, onboard power, which makes it difficult to do things like censoring the rail cars uh, and understanding things like predictive maintenance long before uh, something may take place. And the other thing is, is common in discussion here is, is long trains uh, are causing uh, questions about how safe that is and if there's uh, a push to longer trains, if that's having a negative impact on safety. Uh, a couple of the solutions there is just enabling smaller trains to be uh, more effective and then putting on uh, the sensor feedback for those vehicles. So uh, when we're building out these vehicles and, and looking at them on an individual car basis, we have a lot of the information that you would need uh, and we can track it and kind of dynamically give feedback because we have onboard power and because we have accelerometers, gyros, uh, GPSs. We can things see things like uh, predictive bearing maintenance. We can see things like uh, potential rough track or wide gauge uh, that can be automatically detected and, and fed back into the system. And then you can correct uh, and prevent uh, the types of incidents that we've seen um, and that have been kind of front and center. 
And really, that's all enabled by the shift from an unpowered rail asset um, that might be 100 or 200 cars in length to give an insight on each individual car uh, or cars just as they're distributed down that consist. Uh, and we see that as a really strong way to improve safety uh, and improve uh, reliability of these systems. And then on an independent basis as well, uh, a tug bolt on its own has a shorter stopping distance uh, where you can get to starting and stopping more on the order magnitude of a, a truck. So when you're looking at something going 20 miles an hour, you might be able to stop in as little as four car lengths uh, with the traditional braking systems as well as the tug bolt electric uh, braking systems. And that really does also uh enable you to see a potential incidence and then avoid uh, the consequences of of what's taking place there uh, in a way where, again, on a traditional train, uh, it's really not set up to start and stop uh, in that type of speed. Okay, Tim, you and your team are doing a great job. We're excited this work is happening in the St. Louis region. Anything else you want our audience to know? Yeah, I think... As always, there's still a really strong uh, environmental benefit here, and the, the benefit is partially modal shift from trucking to rail. Uh, rail on its own, again, still has that 9.35 time better uh, greenhouse gas emissions per ton mile, um, and uh, that gives rail a really strong environmental story. Once we electrify and, and at the vehicle level have no emissions, uh, that has an even stronger story. The efficiencies of steel track and, and steel wheels uh, reduce the energy input totally required by the system. Uh, and ultimately, we see a really strong pathway, whereas we can move as little as uh, 1% of truck ton miles to tug bolts. Uh, that's going to be 4.4 million metric tons of CO2 eliminated on an annual basis. That's, that's in itself huge. Uh, we also see the continued benefits of reducing road congestion, uh, improving traffic safety, uh, and as a whole, I think it really makes a good close story, uh, and we can offer that without having to uh, require a, a cost premium uh, for these types of technologies. So we're excited about what we're building. I think our customers are excited about what we're building and uh, looking forward to continuing to, to share what we're uh, bringing to market here. Thank you, Tim. It's great to hear that the Federal Railroad Administration is being forward thinking and technology focused as you continue to advance this initiative and also that the rail industry as a whole is open to the potential advantages your new vehicles could deliver. We're excited that you're based here in the St. Louis region and eager to see your continued progress as you work to deliver solutions that will give rail a competitive edge for the next 200 years. We wish you continued success and thank you for joining us today to pro provide this overview. I'd also like to give a final thank you to our sponsors for Freight Week STL 2023. Their support makes it possible for us to deliver the great content that is the hallmark of this annual conference. Freight Week continues today with our 10 a.m. session featuring Israeli-based DocTex Digital Twin Technology that creates a virtual representation of the seabed of ports and waterways. Then at 11 a.m., we'll learn about a St. Louis-based company's partnership with the Port of Long Beach and the role that they are playing in helping to create a supply chain information highway. We hope you can join us and encourage you to share links of any of our Freight Week content with others who may be interested.